Hi, I'm Diane Mitchell Prey, and today we will be talking about functional foot orthotics for our diabetic patient population. We will be reviewing what the goal is of a diabetic functional foot orthotic and the problems the diabetic foot presents. Then we will review what the literature says about functional foot orthotics in this particular patient population and finally go on to review a orthotic prescription and additional considerations for the optimal orthotic device. When creating a diabetic functional foot orthotic, the goals include decreasing pressure and friction on the foot and support the foot out of maximum subtalar joint pronation. This will better reduce overload to the metatarsal heads and avoid pre-ulcerative lesions and ulcers. And this will then hopefully result in reduced infections and limb loss. So we have these goals. Now what problems does a diabetic foot present us with? Well, peripheral neuropathy. When patients don't feel their feet, they can more easily have increased plantar pressure and friction or shear pressure applied to the skin with little to no pain, resulting in blisters, calluses, and ulcers. Also, limited joint mobility in this particular patient population can result in increased metatarsal head pressure and ulceration. As confirmed by multiple authors, one included here from 2004, who studied glycosylation and correlated it with duration of diabetes. They noted that prolonged out-of-control blood glucose or hyperglycemia can result in glycosylation of collagen, which renders it abnormal. This could potentially affect skin, the plantar fat pad, ligaments, the vasculature, and any other connective tissue. Okay, so we have a diabetic patient population with problem feet who require functional foot orthotics. Does the literature support their use? Yes, it does. And I'm going to review several of these findings from these bulleted points. This first paper is a 1991 article, The Relationship of Limited Joint Mobility to Abnormal Foot Pressures and Diabetic Foot Ulcerations. They found that controlling excessive subtalar joint pronation can decrease plantar forefoot pressure in a less mobile diabetic foot. So their conclusion was, if the foot is supposed to be absorbing pressure and adjusting to uneven terrain during the gait cycle through the subtalar joint, then in a limited joint mobility foot type, as seen in diabetes, the result would be a foot that is unable to do this effectively and may therefore be unable to maintain the quote unquote normal plantar pressure and result in ulceration. This next paper is a 2003 article, Predictive Value of Foot Pressure Assessment as Part of a Population-Based Diabetes Disease Management Program. They found that foot ulcers do not necessarily happen in areas of peak pressure. So remember this for later on in this talk. Plantar pressure alone is a poor ulcer indicator. These three papers, including a 2006 paper, Efficacy and Me Mechanism of Orthotic Devices to Unload Metatarsal Heads in People with Diabetes and a History of Plantar Ulcers, a 2004 article, Effectiveness of Insoles on Plantar Pressure Redistribution, and a 2003 paper, Effects of Total Contact Insoles on Plantar Stress Redistribution, all found increased surface area contact to the plantar foot results in decreased pressures to any one spot and is therefore effective to prevent ulcerations. All three studies showed decreased peak plantar pressure noted with better arch contact throughout the entire plantar foot and this was despite increased plantar midfoot pressures with molded total contact devices. This next paper is from 2013, How Effective is Orthotic Therapy in Patients with Recurrent Diabetic Foot Ulcers? This was a prospective study with 100 neuropathic patients. The before treatment re-ulcer rate was 79% and the amputation rate was 54%. And following custom orthotic fabrication coupled with a diabetic shoe, both were geared to reduce plantar pressures. The two-year re-ulcer rate was 15% and the amputation rate was also reduced all the way down to 6%. Some other information they looked at was sick leave. 
And 100% of the patients at the beginning were on sick leave. And this was reduced down to only 26%. Tremendous improvement. And finally, this 2004 article, Effectiveness of Insoles on Planter Pressure Redistribution. These authors went on to report that molded and firmer devices were better than flat or soft devices in resisting body weight. So in order to best avoid deformation under body weight and better redistribute plantar pressure, a semi-rigid device, as pictured on the bottom right, is perhaps better than a soft accommodative device, as pictured on the left. So knowing this information, we can attempt an ideal functional foot orthotic prescription for the diabetic patient. These will be geared to resist deformation, control excessive subtalar joint pronation with the largest surface area contact possible to best redistribute plantar pressure and avoid any one area of pressure large enough to result in an ulceration. I recommend a non-weight bearing casting position in order to best capture the arch height and avoid an orthotic with too low of an arch, as noted in a partial or full weight bearing cast, with the subtalar joint neutral, mid tarsal joint locked, and plantar flexed first metatarsal. You can combine this with a wide device, and you may even consider a medial phalange to further increase surface area contact beneath the entire plantar foot, with a minimum arch fill, again to ensure a glove-like contact to the plantar foot. A deep heel cup will assist further in subtalar joint control with a possible medial heel skive to additionally control excess pronation. All stabilized on a flat EVA rear foot post. Another orthotic shell consideration in an excessively pronated foot with a, for example, prominent navicular tuberosity is the addition of a sweet spot to reinforce cushion to the area without compromising the minimum arch fill component of your prescription. Finally, adding a top cover to the toes is important, especially to pad a foot that's got fat pad atrophy or calluses, or to add a forefoot adjustment to offload problem spots. I almost always have the lab glue only the heel portion of my top covers to the orthotic shell so I can more easily access the undersurface for additional adjustments as needed. When considering top cover materials, authors, as noted at the bottom of this slide, have noted that pour-on is more effective and durable and dampening, and even more so when in combination with a material such as Plastizote or Spenco. Pour-on alone can tear easily, so it is better to cover it with another material. You may even consider leather or vinyl. Additionally, if your patient has severe fat pad atrophy, you may consider reinforcing the top cover with a three millimeter thick pour on extension, maybe to the metatarsal heads only. Uh, you can stop at the sulcus level to avoid toe crowding inside the shoe. Or if there's a single metatarsal head that's more prominent than the others, you could consider a forefoot extension with a slot cut out for that single metatarsal head to be offloaded in, or consider a metatarsal pad or bar to offload the plantar metatarsal head pressure. These are some various pictures of prior orthotic prescriptions where we've either offloaded or just reinforced padding across the metatarsal head distribution. However, we learned earlier that plantar pressure alone is a poor ulcer indicator. And this is because ulcers develop not only due to plantar pressure, but also due to shear or frictional forces. So this should, perhaps, be taken into account on your prescription. PTFE, also known as polytetrafluoroethylene, has the lowest coefficient of friction of any orthotic material at 0 0.16. In order to prevent irritation to the skin caused by friction, you want to use materials with the lowest coefficient of friction possible. To put it in perspective, this chart shows the coefficient of friction of various other materials in relation to PTFE in both dry on the bottom left and wet on the bottom right environments. You can note that there is no sensitivity to moisture of PTFE. Its coefficient of friction stays at 0 0.16. 
while something such as moleskin, just to the left of PTFE, goes from a 0.63 up to a 0.87 coefficient of friction when it's wet. So it becomes more abrasive, potentially. PTFE is designed to reduce shear or frictional forces in a high-risk ulcer patient location by being applied as a patch to the top of an orthotic. This will lower the coefficient of friction to that high-risk site in an attempt to prevent ulcer formation. This 2005 paper, Wear and Biomechanical Characteristics of a Novel Shear Reducing Insole with Implications for High-Risk Persons with Diabetes, looked at a similar material called GlideSoft and found a 57% less peak shear force when compared to a standard insole, which could perhaps reduce skin breakdown, blistering, and ulceration. And this 2012 article, Shear Reducing Insoles to Prevent Foot Ulceration in High-Risk Diabetic Patients, looked at a similar low coefficient of friction, which they called two thin nonstick sheets placed in between layers of EVA and foam diabetic inserts to reduce shear stress. And they found that the shear reducing insole group was 3.5 times less likely to develop an ulcer compared to a standard diabetic insole. This is a tremendous reduction. So in conclusion, a properly molded and prescribed functional foot orthotic can be effective in ulcer prevention in the diabetic patient population. I hope I provided you with a useful lecture. Thank you for your time. My references are also included on the ProLab Orthotics website. Have a wonderful day.